The following interview was conducted with James W. Barony, Professor Emeritus of Industrial, in Industrial Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, June 30th, 2011 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Good morning, Professor Barony. Good morning, Thank Catherine. you very much. Let's start out, uh, tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years in grade school. Well, uh, I was born in South Bend, Indiana, 1930. Uh, my parents were Hungarian immigrants that came out in 1910, and uh, I had a sister who was born in 1916, and uh, she's actually 14 years older uh, than I am. And uh, basically, uh, <coughs> well, I grew up in South Bend. Uh, I went to a, a, a parochial school. Uh, 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 grade school, St. Stephen's, and then my parents, want, my mother especially, uh, wanted me to go to Notre Dame. However, in those days, back in the late 40s, uh, Notre Dame was a relatively exclusive all-men's uh, boarding school, and they really didn't cater to uh, local students. Uh, so I went to a Catholic prep school in Aurora, Illinois, Marmion, uh, that was taught by the Maris brothers, similar to Burbuff, I guess, in Indianapolis right now. And I uh, was fortunate enough there to uh, graduate uh, uh, as a class valedictorian. And because of that, I was given an opportunity to take the entrance exam at Notre Dame and uh, I was admitted to Notre Dame as a day student rather than uh, a regular a member of the uh, uh, boarding school. It was primarily uh, everybody lived on campus. There was just a very few uh, local students. Uh, got my bachelor's degree from uh, Notre Dame uh, in mechanical engineering. My father worked for Studebakers, and uh, their slogan was the father's son craftsman. So if your father worked at Studebakers, it was just automatic that you would be given a job also at Studebakers. So after I turned 18, I uh, made application to Studebakers in January 1949. I was called in. And I went to work on the third shift. So I worked the third shift from 11 to 7, went home, cleaned up, changed clothes. Uh, Notre Dame in those days, <clears throat> the, uh, there was a dress code, sort of business casual. And uh, I, uh, I'd go to classes and uh, then uh, I'd come home around noon, uh, sleep. And, get up around maybe uh, well, about 7 or 8 o'clock, get ready, go to work at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, <clears throat> I kept, I made sure I took all my courses early in the morning, and I was a part-time student. I only took maybe uh, two or three courses up to 1950. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then in uh, July 1950, the Korean conflict uh, uh, broke out, and the people who were full-time st uh, students in uh, essential occupations, uh, such as engineering, could get a deferment. So then I uh, went back and t I started going to school full-time, uh, and I got my degree in '53. Uh, went to work for, I was working at, at Studebakers all this time <clears throat> as a production worker, but then after I got my degree, I went to work for Bendix for six months uh, in uh, research and development. And then I got drafted and went into the service <clears throat> for two years. Uh, I uh, ended up at uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Combat Engineering Battalion in Korea, attached to the 24th Infantry Division. And uh, after I served two years in the service, I came back out, went back to Bendix, uh, and 
uh, essentially got a different type of an assignment, a production liaison uh, job, which I liked, uh, working out on the shop floor, uh, essentially coming up with tools, jigs, and fixtures to uh, improve assembly of uh, uh, fuel metering devices. And um, I had the GI Bill, so I decided that maybe I'd use the GI Bill to get a master's degree. I came down to Purdue and uh, on a Saturday afternoon, and uh, actually a Saturday morning, I should say, uh, I came down on a Saturday morning and uh, went over to mechanical engineering where I had my degree uh, from at uh, Notre Dame. They said, well, if you want to go into manufacturing, there's a new program that just started. It's called industrial engineering. You have to go over to, <clears throat> to uh, uh, the uh, what was left of Hevelin Hall, in the back of Hevelin Hall, and talk to Professor Amrine. <clears throat> so I talked to him, and he said, well, with your industrial experience, if you come in and get a master's degree, we could actually use you on our faculty staff to teach in our laboratories. So I came here and uh, uh, enrolled as a master's uh, degree student in uh, 1956. <clears throat> the School of Industrial Engineering at Purdue uh, actually was formed in 1912. Uh, the first, uh, first of all, let me explain what industrial engineering is. Uh, uh, basically what happened was mechanical engineering has always been um, involved with the design and, uh, of a uh, given product. And uh, around the turn of the century, there was a mechanical engineering by the name of Frederick Winslow Taylor that says, we ought to put as much effort into designing how we're going to manufacture the product as we do designing the product itself. And basically, he called this production engineering, and later on it became known as industrial engineering. And uh, Penn State in 1908 essentially set up the first industrial engineering curriculum, and Purdue followed suit, and they came up with a curriculum but it was an option in mechanical engineering. What you could get was a Bachelor of Science degree in uh, mechanical engineering with an IE option. So you took the first two, two and a half years of industrial engineer of uh, mechanical engineering related to the design of the product, and then the last year and a half on how you manufactured the product. And uh, <clears throat> that essentially was the start of industrial engineering. And, and uh, <clears throat> it went along, along those lines. Uh, in 1938, oh, I think about 38, uh, Dean uh, Potter uh, asked uh, Lillian Gilbreth, whose uh, <clears throat> husband, uh, Frank Gilbreth, uh, was a uh, colleague of uh, uh, Taylor, uh, and they taught primarily in the human aspects of, of the uh, of the uh, operation. That is, uh, she had a degree in uh, industrial psychology from Brown University, and Dean Potter asked her to come to Purdue and start teaching in this new program, and she did, but because she had a degree in psychology and not in engineering, Potter refused to give her a, a title of a professor of engineering. Rather, he gave her a professor of management degree, even though there wasn't a school of management at that time. <clears throat> so. Uh, she, uh, Lillian Gilbert was on the faculty to 1947, and uh, basically the program grew, and uh, by 1955 there was a critical mass of about eight faculty members and about 100 students in this option, 
and the Board of Trustees decided to make it a, a program by itself, School of Industrial Engineering and Management in 1955, and uh, Harold Damrine was made the head of the program, and I arrived in 1956 when the first students were being admitted. Uh, Purdue was a completely different university back in, than what we know it as now. Uh, it was the land-grant university in the state of Indiana. Its primary mission was to educate the sons and daughters of the citizens of the state of Indiana in the area of agriculture, mechanical arts, or, or engineering. And there were only about 13,000, 14,000 students at Purdue. And there were, it was primarily an a, a, a industrial institute type thing. There was no school of liberal arts and humanities or nursing. or It was just the engineering, agriculture, uh, chemistry, uh, sciences, the chemistry, physics department, mm -hmm. mathematics, etc. Okay. It was a, uh, a state university. It was uh, state supported. So consequently, if you were a, a resident of the state of Indiana, there was no tuition. It was tuition free because it was a state university. Uh, there were fees of $100 a semester and that covered your athletic advance, uh, uh, push, uh, Purdue uh, Student Hospital, uh, co-rec gym, uh, convocations, and all the other non-academic aspects. But all the, the tuition for going to cl classes uh, was free if you were uh, just, like, just like a high school. Yeah. Of course, now we're uh, state-assisted, and we only get about 23% of our uh, budget from the state. But in those days, everything came from the state. Yeah. And uh, Hovde had, uh, Pre President Hovde at that time, uh, uh, forbid any kind of a fundraising campaign other than for the John Purdue Club, which had a fundraiser for uh, ath uh, support of athletes. But uh, basically, according to him, he only had 150 uh, fundraisers, uh, uh, 50 in the, in the Senate and 100 in the House of Representatives. And um, so when I got my degree uh, in, uh, uh, actually, in, in those days, it, the, the calendar was June rather than May. So I graduated in, in June. Uh, 1958, uh, uh, I uh, was uh, given an opportunity to join the faculty as an instructor, as a regular f faculty position uh, in those days. Uh, nowadays, you would call graduate teaching assistants, but I was an instructor, and uh, Harold Damron said, you can, uh, you can come and be a full-time instructor as such uh, and, uh, with your master's degree, but someday everybody will have to have a PhD to uh, uh, teach at the university level. And I recommend that you just come in as an instructor and uh, <clears throat> then stay on and take courses um, towards your PhD. You could take one course or, or in the uh, semester, in some cases two courses, and then you could also do your research during the summer and uh, work for your PhD, which I did. And uh, although I went on to the faculty in 1958, uh, after I got my PhD in 1961, I uh, uh, actually got promoted by the Board of Trustees from the rank of assistant to, uh, uh, from the rank of instructor to the rank of assistant professor. And uh, the time I spent, the three years I spent as instructor was used as time in grade, so to speak, on my uh, service report. So uh, two years later, I was uh, promoted from uh, assistant to 
associate professor with tenure. And uh, basically, uh, in those days, um, uh, a great emphasis was put on teaching and uh, how, how, much, how, how well uh, you were accepted by the students and uh, your teaching evaluations. Uh, the research was somewhat secondary. Uh, you were expected to try to do some research with your graduate students, but it wasn't the main uh, issue like it is right now. So it, you could actually uh, become a, a tenured, uh, uh, gain tenure uh, just by excelling in teaching. Uh, and I essentially went the teaching route rather than the research route, although I did quite a bit of research when I was uh, in my early years uh, uh, <clears throat> for my PhD dissertation, I developed a, a force platform uh, that essentially uh, measured bodily movements and using these bodily movement measurements, you could correlate them to the physiological cost of work so that you could look at different types of jobs and see how much they, they uh, would cost uh, from a physiological cost so that if a person had a heart attack or something like that was recovering, you could essentially come up with a work prescription on here's the type of work you can do and here are the type of things you should avoid uh, from the physiological cost of doing the work. And I got an NSF grant to uh, develop the force platform and I uh, built one and it became part of the uh, uh, the uh, NSF in those days had a program to develop uh, equipment for laboratories and it became known as the Purdue force platform. Several of them were built, uh, one in Kansas uh, State University by a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Steve Kuntz, who later I got to know very well because I worked with him in, in, on a consulting job uh, with Western Electric in Kansas City. And uh, <clears throat> then I also got involved with uh, a graduate student by the name of uh, Byron Nelson, and uh, we did some research on uh, uh, predicting uh, the uh, capabilities of dynamic visual acuity uh, inspection of, of component parts as on, on a moving uh, belt and uh, how to correlate that back to uh, just a visual acuity and, and the speed at which you could, you could actually uh, follow through on looking for different types of defects. And uh, that did quite a bit of work in the area of dynamic visual acuity mm -hmm. as well as on learning. Well, <coughs> George Bolin, uh, we uh, did some research for uh, Delphi. Uh, uh, actually, in those days, it was Delco. It was before General Motors uh, split Delco off and into a Delphi. But we worked with Delco up in um, uh, Co Kokomo, Indiana, and uh, they had a union. In their union contract, they had a, a provision for bumping rights. That is to say, if if your job was eliminated, you could go and find any other job where the operator had less seniority than you had, and you could bump that person, and you had 10 days to qualify for the job. Then that person would then essentially have to bump somebody else, and it finally cascaded down to the, po to the pl point where uh, the person with the least amount of uh, seniority uh, was laid off. Uh, they wanted to know what was the cost of this provision. So we went in there and studied the decrease in productivity during the learning phase of the 10 days that you had to qualify for the job and then followed this through on for about a year we did this on uh, 
over uh, close to 200 different uh, jobs and found out the total cost of, of this provision in the, uh, the labor contract, which was, was quite sizable. It was in the yeah. millions of dollars, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, I was being active in research and also teaching. Uh, I received the best teaching award uh, from the students. Uh, uh, but when they, at the end of the year, they vote on the, their uh, best teacher that they had. So I received the best teaching award. So in 1969, I was promoted to the rank of full professor of industrial engineering. Mm -hmm. At that same time, Professor Limecooler was uh, made the new head of industrial engineering, Professor Amrheim essentially stepped down, went on sabbatical, came back, and then essentially became the uh, associate dean for uh, undergraduate education, in those days called freshman engineering. And uh, uh, I should go back a little bit. Uh, back in 1950 or so, uh, Henry Potter, uh, uh, came up to the age of 70, I believe, in those days, and uh, stepped down as dean of, of engineering. And uh, Professor George Hawkins, who was head of mechanical engineering, became the new dean. And in those days, you had to apply to whatever program that you're interested in. That is, you'd make application to mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, civil engineering. And you were admitted by that department, and you went through their four-year pr program. Well, there was a great deal of movement back and forth during the first couple of years. People would come in, think that they wanted to become a mechanical engineer, and then decided later on they wanted to become electrical engineering vice versa, electrical engineers wanted to transfer over to mechanical engineer. So George Hawkins had the idea of having a common first year where the students could then go out and explore the various disciplines, then make a decision at the beginning of their sophomore year, and uh, hopefully cut down on this uh, uh, transferring back and forth. There was a committee set up to study this. And actually, they came up with a common uh, uh, first two-year program, uh, uh, pretty much like the university uh, uh, student uh, program we have right now, the USP. The only problem was uh, uh, chemical engineering, because chemical engineering requires so much chemistry. Uh, they just couldn't fit their cr uh, program in. so. They decided to just do it for the first first year rather than the first two years, although in many cases you can <coughs> go from one one uh, one program to another program at up through the first two years, and the courses that you've taken uh, can be used as technical electives in your your new uh, 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 program that you select on change degree objectives. Like what, students call CODO process. So uh, George Hawkins called in Al Spaulding from Mechanical Engineering, and uh, he asked uh, essentially uh, to put together this department, and he did. And uh, so we had this freshman engineering program that uh, Spaulding had. But Spaulding didn't have a faculty. Uh, Basically, each of the individual schools contributed somebody to um, for their advising, and maybe work four to four hours a week up in first year engineering. Uh, well, in those days, it's called first year engineering now, but in those days it was called freshman engineering. And uh, uh, I was asked uh, in. 
1966 or so, uh, if I would go over and be the industrial engineering liaison uh, for the uh, freshman engineering program. So I, I started there and I got to know all the students in first year engineering and then I would meet them and greet them, so to speak, as they came into the School of Industrial Engineering. And I got to know the undergraduate program, uh, students fairly well. So uh, our new head, uh, Ferd Limecooler, asked me to essentially be the associate head for undergraduate education uh, for the industrial engineering program. And uh, I agreed to that, and that was in 1970. Uh, at the same time, uh, he said, well, there isn't too many, the graduate program wasn't as large as it is now. So he also put in the graduate students. So I was really the associate head for academic affairs mm -hmm. because I not only had the undergraduate program, which was my major, assignment, but also the graduate program. But the graduate program was run primarily by the major professors. And uh, as the uh, associate head there, I was just involved with uh, signing the papers for admission and then getting the students as they come in lined up with a major professor. And then the major professors took over and essentially followed through until uh, the students graduated. So. The assignment there was at that time much time consuming, but the uh, undergraduate program was different. There, there I had to help the students register, set up an advising program, things of that nature. And uh, <coughs> Harold Damrein uh, went on to become head of the uh, freshman engineering, uh, and of course. Knowing, knowing me, he asked me that in the summer if I would come in and uh, help with the day on campus program. So uh, in, we would bring all the students with their parents onto campus for one day, known as day on campus, sit down, talk to the parents, uh, talk to the students, go over the students' background, and essentially design a curriculum for each individual student with the parents actually sitting down there with the uh, advisor uh, in the advisor's office. And it was a very personal type of thing. We talked about a, a triangle with the student at the apex and the faculty and the parents at the base so the faculty and, and, and parents working together to assure success uh, of the students. And uh, uh, so I did that uh, again uh, uh, for as my summer assignment, uh, being involved with uh, almost all, all the students that came through. Uh, I made the uh, presentation in the morning and talk to the parents at the same time. And uh, <clears throat> I did that up to about 1970. So from 66 to 1970, I worked with fresh, uh, in the freshman engineering program, uh, as well as uh, being associate head of the School of Industrial Engineering. Mm -hmm. I uh, got very involved with the Institute of Industrial Engineering. And uh, in 1970, I became the uh, director of the student conferences and awards. <clears throat> we set up a, uh, a uh, program where each regional ca uh, ca uh, campus, that is to say that we broke the United States up into regions. Uh, nine regions in Canada was the tenth region, and uh, we uh, would have a student conference, a student chapter conference, and then the winning paper of that student conference 
we sent out for judging, and then we would give uh, a uh, an award of five hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, and two hundred dollars uh, to the first, uh, second, and third uh, winners of the technical paper contest. The intent of having these uh, conferences. Uh, uh, at each at a given whole school was essentially the the technical paper conference was the APE, the center focus of, of the conference and the idea was to get students involved in improving their technical writing uh, as often as heard and this was especially true in 1970 there was some major concern that engineers uh, had difficulty communicating and actually uh, they're having problems with their uh, uh, skills, their writing skills. So uh, uh, the conferences, were, uh, the technical paper conference was to improve the writing capabilities and pre oral presentations of the, uh, of the students. And uh, I ran that program for close to 15 years. And uh, because of that, <coughs> I got some national notoriety in the Institute. And I was, went to all the conferences. And I was there at the conferences for setting up the uh, technical paper contest uh, for the winners at the, at the local uh, uh, regional campuses, uh, the conferences. And uh, w with that, uh, I, uh, I got made, I uh, was nominated and, and voted upon. And I think in 1982, I was uh, elected to be a, a fellow of the Institute. And then about three years later, I uh, was uh, uh, essentially elected and given the um, uh, Holzman uh, 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 Outstanding, uh, 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 no, the Fred Crane, the Fred Crane Outstanding Service Award for my contributions to the, for the Institute. And I held that position for about 18 years, and, and after about 18 years it was time to turn it on over to somebody new and have some new ideas and some some uh, a new approach, so to speak. <coughs> so I, I finished that, that as, uh, assignment. At the same time, uh, as I was phasing out of the undergraduate uh, student uh, 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 programs, I was asked to uh, be a member of the ABET accreditation board for uh, the uh, American Society of Engineering Education had what was called ECPD, Engineering Council for uh, Education uh, uh, Evaluation uh, uh, Program. So, so uh, later it became known as ABET, the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology. And uh, the idea there was that the uh, go around and look at the various programs and, and essentially make sure that they had met, met, met at least minimal standards for uh, being accredited as have giving an accredited degree in engineering or in technology. And uh, I was asked to serve on that board for five years and uh, went around uh, uh, first, I was on the board, and then I also had to uh, make about <clears throat> two to three trips uh, a year to various institutions and, and essentially uh, review their programs, make recommendations where there might have some difficulties in sponsoring uh, uh, student uh, uh, research uh, capabilities or opportunities and things of that nature. And uh, so for five years I spent on, on that, doing that for 
for the accreditation board. And then another five years, I was uh, put on a ad hoc committee for a general engineering program. I mean, before I was rep I was a representative for industrial engineering, but there's been some programs like at Purdue we call it IDE. Uh, students call it eventually uh, I'll decide uh, type of, but uh, IDE is uh, essentially a, a, a program for interdisciplinary engineering and other programs just call it general engineering. These are core, uh, programs that are do not necessarily uh, meet uh, the qualifications of a given well-known discipline like mechanical engineering, electrical, civil engineering. A student wants to be a, an engineer, but he wants to essentially uh, work in the, uh, let's say, a studio uh, uh, on lighting, uh, a lighting engineer uh, for uh, a Broadway musical or something of that nature. Well, he has to have a background in engineering, electrical engineering, uh, illumination, uh, lighting, and at the same time he needs a background in, in theater and arts. So he could take these two disciplines and put them together and make a new type of engineering program for him. I mean, an interdisciplinary engineering program in studio uh, lighting or uh, uh, you could have somebody who wants to go into oceanography, although we're landlocked here in Indiana, we can work with some schools that, like Rhode Island that has an oceanography program. Students could take courses here and then maybe spend a year uh, uh, at sea on one of these oceanography uh, 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 programs. So. And the program still exists uh, today. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, really intended for those students who can't find a uh, specific uh, area uh, that, that they want to major in uh, because it just doesn't it doesn't exist. So they put together their own school of engineering. And <clears throat> again, to make sure that these would meet. Uh, the uh, accreditation guidelines and principles, uh, there had to be a, a committee set up for that. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we, um, I was on that committee and I served there for six years. Uh, meanwhile, uh, back at the ranch here at Purdue, I was teaching uh, two to three courses a semester at the undergraduate level, and I had a graduate pr program on, in uh, design of experiments and uh, research techniques in, in engineering, industrial engineering. Uh, I became, was started out as IE601. It was intended for graduate students uh, to get them started on writing their master's thesis or dissertation. But then we thought the undergraduates would also benefit in their senior year from uh, looking at uh, research and, and uh, how do you approach a problem. Uh, so we made it a 500 level course, i.e. 533, uh, Design of Experiments, uh, which is also really uh, a uh, introduction to uh, uh, how to conduct uh, a research program, and uh, I was ta being teaching those courses, and I was nominated uh, by my, my by the students actually, uh, and endorsed by the head uh, of the program. Uh, by now, uh, Professor Leimkuller had been replaced by uh, 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 the prof uh, Professor um, uh, Wilbur Meyer, 
uh, from, uh, he was originally from uh, Texas A&M. And uh, Wilbur Meyer was the head, and he nominated me for, for this, um, for the uh, uh, a teaching, uh, 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 basically a, 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 an academy for, for teaching. So, so the, I, I was w one of the uh, founding members of the Purdue uh, Teaching Academy. And uh, I also uh, was the recipient of the uh, uh, Outstanding Undergraduate Teaching Award uh, in 1989 uh, by um, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Murphy Award, as it's called, uh, and based on that, on that uh, results of that, I was on the inaugural uh, uh, selection for the Book of Great Teachers. So I, I, I've been very pleased. I, I uh, these are these are awards I didn't personally go out and seek. Uh, they came about by being nominated for them by the students and then endorsed by the head of the School of Industrial Engineering and then selected by a separate panel of my peers here in the, in the university. So these are always special awards because you're really gaining recognition you're being recognized for your contributions by your peers uh, rather than uh, something that you set up and do by yourself. Uh, in 1989, as I said, I, well, I received the Charles B. Murphy Award. I also, for the second time, received the A.A. A. Potter Outstanding uh, Engineering uh, Educator Award, and then, uh, unknown to me, uh, I was nominated for the Institute of Industrial Engineering, the uh, Al Holzman uh, Outstanding uh, or Distinguished Engineer, uh, Education Award. So I received the Holzman Distinguished Engineering Education Award. So, so I looked at 1989 as having sort of won the triple uh, crown uh, in teaching. And uh, my name is listed in the Book of Great Teachers here in the Union uh, in the plaque. And they decided to put them in alphabetically. So if you want to see my name, you go to the upper left-hand corner, corner, count down three plaques, two plaques over, fourth name. That, that's where I'm at, uh, type of thing. So, um, I uh, and then uh, I, I've been very fortunate. I, 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 uh, I my uh, students have uh, have uh, nominated me. I, I've worked with my students, but I never really went out of my way to ask them for any types of nominations. But um, I. Uh, I was, uh, last year I was surprised, uh, I was nominated by someone, that I don't really know who, uh, but some, somebody nominated me for the Special Boilermaker uh, Award. And uh, during the uh, first game at, at Purdue with Ball State at the end of the first, uh, first quarter, I was asked to come out on the field, and uh, I was given a, a replica of the uh, Boilermaker Special, with a metal replica of the Boilermaker. And uh, Chuck Cosgrove, who was uh, also uh, given the award, the two of us were given the award. The reason for Chuck Cosgrove is because of his um, work with mechanical engineers uh, and being recognized as one of their uh, outstanding teachers. And 
somewhat like I was uh, back in 89. Uh, but in my case, it was the fact that I, I was retiring in uh, the year uh, 2010. And uh, after uh, uh, 42 years on the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, it's actually uh, uh, 50. 50, 52 years on the faculty. And uh, out of that, I was on the, I served as the associate head for 35 years. So uh, <clears throat> I, uh, that was the basis for the nomination, I guess, and, and I got that. And then about a month ago, I got a very pleasant surprise. I have always worked since 1972. I've worked as the faculty representative for the uh, curriculum for the uh, uh, computer, um, for the engineering, cooperative engineering education program, uh, co-op as they call it. Uh, there again, uh, everything in the university changes, and uh, it was called the co-op program, and I'll always call it the co-op program, but they changed the name of it to Professional Practices Program, and uh, they uh, set up a Hall of Fame, and I guess I was uh, nominated, and uh, I'm going to be inducted in their Hall of Fame. Uh, in, uh, at homecoming uh, this October, uh, basically uh, <clears throat> uh, based on the fact that I've worked with the Industrial Engineering Co-op Program since 1972, even though I retired last year as a professor emeritus, I had a need for doing something other than just sitting back and taking care of my 130-acre farm.